Hello? Can you hear me? Hi, I'd like to start this discussion by asking a question of people, and usually I ask them, what was the first domesticated animal? And I get a lot of responses that are dog or goat, and in this state, cow, of course. But what if we're the answer to that question? What if society, attachment to place, settlement, and even cities are part of our evolution as humans? Part of what, in fact, make us human. Darwin was the first to sort of suppose that there were physical attributes to us that represented domestication. And in terms of social evolution, there's little dispute that when we started to settle in societies, work together and live more closely, and build stronger ties, that we had accomplished an evolutionary milestone. But that's not a very easy realization for people to swallow. As a recent article on uh, human domestication mentioned, nobody really likes to be told that they're tame. But what if that attribute is actually responsible for some of the biggest milestones that we've accomplished um, as humans? Over the last 10,000 years, we've been moving into settlements, and that movement to settlements has been accompanied by huge innovations. And at first, we wanted to develop agriculture, and that was the reason for some of the settlement specialization. But eventually, some of the innovations that came out of cities and settlements were never planned for, and they're with us today. Things like government, politics, even rights came about. And as we developed stores of food, we invented writing to, create, to track those inventories, as well as document transactions between established settlements. And you see trade forming and many more settlements forming around the world. And in the last 2,000 years, you see global infrastructure for trade being developed, and you see some of the global hubs for finance and commerce and trade that we're familiar with um, being founded, like New York, London. And this is also the period from which most of my training in graduate school in urban planning came from. And if you look at the population numbers on the bottom of the graph, you can see that in the last 300 years, there's been an explosion in urban population. And if you know much about global environmental change, you may see some similarities between that graph and another famous or infamous graph called the hockey stick graph, which depicts increases, recent increases, in global greenhouse gas concentrations in the last thousand years, over the last few thousand years. And the parallels between global environmental change and human urbanization are scary. But the scariest part may be that Though it took 100 centuries for us to reach this 3.5 billion mark that we're at now, which is about half of the population, in the next 100 years, we're expected to have, uh, add about 5 billion new urban residents. And so as we talk about designing change today, this shouldn't be really a scary prospect, but thought of as an opportunity. Because all of the construction that took place from Mesopotamia to now is going to happen all over again in those next 100 years. So for designing change, we have a huge opportunity. And the decisions we make about human settlement in cities and what that looks like and how it works could take us in a completely different direction. But we have to ask sort of, what does that look like? Can we all live like Thoreau and Walden? Well, if you take the arable land on the planet and divide it by nine billion people, you have about an acre and a half for a family of four. And they're responsible for all their agriculture. That doesn't leave much room for shops, businesses, or time. And it leaves very little room for other things that we might need, like biodiversity. Can we all adopt the suburb that's become so prominent in the US? And it seems like that's the path that emerging economies like India and China are now taking. They're highly subsidized in this country and being adopted widely around the world, even as in this country we spend a lot of money trying to do the, undo the ills that they've created in the past 50 years. They eat up farmland, they create energy dependencies that are pretty unsustainable. And of course, we want to avoid pitfalls of hyperdensity. I want to point out, though, that density does not have to be associated with the characteristics that make this a slum. The characteristics that make this a slum are not innately urban. Inadequate access to sanitation and water 
inadequate housing quality and lack of secure tenure for housing are not necessarily urban qualities. Some of the richest, poorest, dirtiest, cleanest places I can think of are all in cities. What we need is new models of urbanism, and that works on two levels. First, the way that cities sit within the natural world and how they depend on that world for nutrients and create waste that go into that. And then second, to think about place. We need to think about cities as designing high-quality place for people to thrive. And that involves not just the physical environment, but the social environment and enabling government structures and civic processes that go with that. So if you look at the trends um, in global urban population and global environmental change, it would be easy to think of urbanism as the driver of those problems. But I don't think it has to be. I believe that if we embrace urbanism as a human quality, then we might be able to find answers to some of the most pressing issues that we face as a species. One of the first steps in doing that is to reestablish a connection with nature. Recognizing cities as part of who we are and as part of nature can be important for that. And historically, cities have sort of reinforced this dominance of humans over nature. We pave over farmland, we take the streams and put them into pipes, we, use, we have been using nature for our own benefit. New models need to think about how urbanism fits into existing disciplines, and you're already seeing fields like environmental sociology and urban ecology spring up around these ideas. Now, in a more real way, we need to think of urbanism as more than just being rural or urban. That's what the 3.5 billion number would have, us to, would have us believe, that people live in one or the other. But actually, there are degrees of urbanism. If we move from the left to the right, we have higher degrees of urbanism. And that doesn't just mean people living closer together. That means intense use of the land, a lot of different activities occurring on that land. It means quality, places that people want to live in, that people want to take care of, that people want ownership of, they want to work to make better. And it means connectivity. It doesn't mean that thing, something is just close. It means that you can actually get to it. And one of the, there are several environmental benefits to moving toward these higher degrees of urbanism. And one that you can see right off the bat is the consumption of land. So if we arrange more people in higher degrees of urbanism, it can act as a conservation strategy for rural and even wilderness lands on the far left side of the spectrum. But it's not just land. We're also seeing that energy use and related pollution can vary with higher degrees of urbanism. And so in this, you see the carbon footprint of different parts of the US, and you can see the green islands of the city, where people live in smaller homes that they have to heat and cool. People drive less and people own less cars. Fewer cars, I should say. And that's surrounded by red donuts, which are mostly suburban areas. And I'm not saying that suburbs can't exist, but surely they can't exist uh, for the majority of the population as they do in this country, where two-thirds of people live in this type of environment. Cities can represent a very important demand side strategy, and we don't have a lot of those. We spend a lot of money on this campus, even, to develop technologies and energy efficiency. But if you develop a more fuel-efficient car just so you can drive further, you're not really making progress. Demand-side strategies can be important. Now, cities work for demand-side strategies because of something that David Owen in his book Green Metropolis calls embodied efficiency. And to describe it, he uses this example where if you live on the red star and you find yourself with single-family homes on either side and eventually commercial districts where you would go to perform your activities, do your shopping, get goods and services. You're really only going to be able to accomplish so much of your life without getting in the car. If this is the distance you'll routinely walk, you really need to borrow from your neighbors or spend money on a car. Um, this, is, this type of neighborhood is referred to as requiring a gallon of gas to get a gallon of milk. And if you consider the higher degree of urbanism with vertical living, mixed use, that same distance, could be when you take the elevator or the steps to the ground floor, you can walk that same distance and reach twice the number of destinations that you had to with your car in the previous example. 
We make a lot of investments in terms of infrastructure. Infrastructures are crucial for day-to-day -day operation, resiliency of the city. And those investments are much more efficiently used when they're surrounded by higher um, levels of density and people. You can see just in this example how the space of the road, an important urban infrastructure, is consumed if we're all living in environments that require us to get in our car and drive. The space is much more efficiently used with transit and cycling. And perhaps one of the most important things about degrees of urbanism is that it has an influence over our behavior. This is the demand side strategy I'm talking about. And so researchers asked people, where would you rather live? What neighborhood would you prefer to live in? Would you rather live in a vibrant downtown district where you could probably accomplish a number of tasks walking without a car? Or would you rather live in a single family home residential district where you might be expected to drive more? Now, it would follow that you expect people who prefer the neighborhood on the left to be more likely to walk and more interested in walking. But no matter what your preference is, if you live in a neighborhood that looks like something on the left, you drive about the same amount. And that's about 10 to 20 miles a day less than people who live in a neighborhood that looks like something on the right. And lastly, one of the major evolutions of the human brain that sort of set us apart is this ability to put ourselves in other situations and other circumstances that may not have existed yet or may never exist. So it makes us empathetic, but also helps us think about the future, put our, understand spatially, spatially where we are. And in this study, they wanted to figure out what effect, how easily do different degrees of urbanism allow us to like, put ourselves in that environment. And they asked people, when they showed them one of these five settings, they would ask them, if you find yourself at the blue circle, which of these two mailboxes, the red circle, is closer, following the street network? And overwhelmingly, when people were shown the higher degrees of urbanism of the regular grid, they, were, they found the decision much more easy to make, and they made that decision much more quickly, perhaps implying that there's something about our brains that would prefer higher degrees of urbanism, or at least find them less confusing. And so you know what I'm probably going to say next. We need to build cities on the moon. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, of course. <laughs> but uh, with any great challenge, people usually evoke the lunar missions or going to the moon. We saw it in a TED talk earlier today. And most of you are familiar with one lunar mission in particular, Apollo 13. If you don't know it, I'll summarize it and to put it mildly, they had a problem, you may recall. Um, they were running low on fuel. Their life support systems were failing or running out. And they were going away from the Earth. They had to figure out an efficient, easy, quick, and successful way to get back. And the way to do that was to use something called a free return trajectory, where you use the momentum, the inertia, and the gravity of the moon to slingshot you 180 degrees back to Earth, completely change your direction. And that metaphor seems appropriate for our situation now, where we find ourselves going in one direction in terms of global environmental change. But we have this momentum as a society, as a, as a species, toward urbanism and the opportunity to really design change over the next 100 years. And we can find ourselves going in a completely different direction if we embrace urbanism as part of our human nature. Thank you.